to, to join us. Good morning, everybody. Welcome to the second half of our COVID lectures. My name is Christy Butler. I'm one of the chief residents at uh, UCSF. It's my pleasure to introduce uh, Dr. Polina Rayblatt. She's coming to us from Southern California Kaiser Permanente and here to talk to us about common complications after gender affirming surgery. Dr. Rayblatt, thanks for joining. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Christy, for the introduction. I also want to thank uh, Lindsay Hampton for uh, putting this together and uh, Kirsty and Michelle for making this very seamless and uh, getting the technology part out of the way. So thank you. I, I know it's a lot of work and a lot of details to get through. Uh, I'm Paulina Rayblatt and uh, I'm part of the Gender Affirmation Surgery Program in Southern California. And I work together with Amanda Chi and Melissa Poe, who are my co-surgeons. Uh, Amanda is a urologist and Melissa is a plastic surgeon. And, uh, as many of you probably know, this is not something you can do uh, in isolation and solo. We're part of a big program with uh, broad support for multiple uh, specialties. And we can talk about it a little bit later. Uh, I don't know how many of you were on this uh, on, uh, on the talk last week that also covered gender affirmation. And But I know there was a question asking difference between affirmation and confirmation. I know that uh, the terminology changed probably about four times even through my relatively short uh, gender surgery uh, career. And uh, English is my second language, so I decided to look this up uh, to really know the exact difference. So affirm uh, on a di in a dictionary means to validate or state positively, to assert as valid and to express someone's dedication. I'll confirm means to ratify and to give assurance. So I think that's where the difference lies, a gender affirmation that we're here just uh, to affirm uh, the gender uh, that uh, the person um, uh, uh, feels alliance with. We're not there to sort of confirm or, uh, or approve uh, a decision. Um, so we'll continue. Hang on one second. There we go. So uh, we, I probably by now, and I know uh, Joe Parisi uh, reviewed uh, our audience in terms of uh, where we are uh, in our expertise and knowledge of transgender uh, surgery or uh, bottom surgery specifically. And I know we vary from minimal knowledge to some of you coming from institutions where you have full service uh, 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 surgery programs. But at the end of the day, uh, why we're doing this? Mostly because it's uh, a right thing to do. And what uh, always stunned me is uh, how many uh, physicians uh, faced with a transgender patient for, in their urologic practice saying, I just don't know what to do. So my uh, biggest impetus is to make people comfortable with uh, patients, with, or with physicians uh, with transgender uh, patients seeing in their clinic. Also, if uh, anyone uh, of you know the uh, lady here with the blue background, blue glasses, this is Jody Faulkner. So if any of you are using Epic as their EHR, as their medical system in the hospital, she is the owner of uh, owner and developer of Epic. So you can thank her for all our EMR uh, successes and challenges. Uh, part of what uh, moved me to help uh, our transgender folks is to know that uh, 23% of uh, patients identified as transgender did not see a doctor when they needed it because of fear of being mistreated. And when surveyed, they've ranked uh, their reasons for not seeing a physician in sort of a following order. And 40% uh, of uh, patients reported that their physicians were poorly educated and specifically uh, transgender, gender non-conforming issues. Uh, the facilities unable to provide proper accommodations, witnessing personnel gossiping, laughing, or telling jokes about them, uh, fear of being outed or misgendered, and uh, experience or prior experience of staff refusal to use preferred pronoun. And it seems like very simple and basic, and I hope none of us are in the practice where this is an experience. And as you know, the experience starts in the front with your clerks and nurses uh, before they even see the physician or even making the appointment. Uh, so my goal after this is so you don't say that you just don't know. Uh, majority of our patients will come see you not to ask for gender affirming surgery, but transgender patients have overactive bladder and they have vaginal atrophy if it's a transgender male who's been on uh, testosterone for a long time. They can have renal masses, bladder cancer, hematuria. 
all the uh, uh, kidney stones. So all the issues we treat in uh, our cisgender patients happen in transgender patients. So if anything, I want you to walk away from this saying that you know how to uh, treat basic things in uh, transgender patients. Uh, statistics you probably have seen is it's about 1.6 million patients. So compared to our prostate cancer, let's say patients or patients with kidney stone, it's a very small proportion. Yet, uh, these patients do consume uh, a relatively high uh, amount of healthcare. So it, it appears that they're more present in our uh, clinics than uh, represented by pure numbers. I will not spend time on the gender bred uh, person or there is a gender unicorn. You probably, most of you have seen it and uh, are relatively fluid in differences between identity, expression, sex, and orientation. Uh, wanted to confirm and affirm that it's not a new thing. It's not because it's been on the news or, you know, on Netflix shows. A mentioning of uh, transgender folks goes as far as 900 BC out of all places in Russia. And transgender folks been with us uh, throughout the world um, in any part of the world. If we look at the United States distribution, we definitely have sort of a coastal distribution, which probably correlates with uh, politics, attitude, and insurance coverage for certain issues rather than, um, and, and just uh, population density. Uh, this is uh, out of an abstract that was submitted to Western Section uh, AUA health policy essay uh, two years ago and uh, showing the medical coverage by state. This is specifically Medi-Cal, but usually commercial coverage is follow that. And as you can see, it somewhat follows our political map as well. Uh, important to know that, uh, back to my idea that uh, not all transgender patients are gonna see you to asking for a bottom surgery or for affirming surgery. Only 20% of transgender patients will uh, actually go through any kind of affirmation surgery and small percentage of those will be uh, asking for bottom surgery. Most of the transgender patients are in the state of either hormone uh, transition or mid-transition uh, without any surgical intervention. Uh, I will not uh, stay long on this. Mostly we're in the area of we're just washing our hands, right? We're all in this. So uh, we probably, most of you know, WPATH is our guiding uh, sort of manual on all things transgender when it comes to healthcare. So it covers mental health, hormone, reproductive health, voice therapy, surgery, and specifically applicable to guidelines to proceed with uh, bottom uh, surgery. So this comes our um, question of the lecture. And this is something that, again, you don't need to be um, knowledgeable in specifics of transgender care because I think every uh, everyone graduating from urology residency is able to do bilateral orchiectomy. So if a transgender patient comes to you with diagnosis of gender dysphoria and asking for a bilateral orchiectomy, which of these criteria they need to meet before you can uh, proceed with a bilateral orchiectomy? So I know uh, Christy will start our poll. Um, and we'll give it a uh, few seconds for uh, you to look and answer. Okay, so uh, the answer that got the highest one is two letters with 12 months of hormones and 12 months of living in desired gender role. Um, and that's actually incorrect. Uh, so I'm glad we're doing this so we can go over the WPATH uh, guidelines. So let me close this and we're gonna move to our next slide. So at least I know we, we can all learn something from this. So if you look at the uh, guidelines from WPATH, I kind of put it in the, um, in the chart so it's easier to remember. And the way you want to break it down is, is it above belly button or below belly button? And as urologists, we obviously deal with things below belly button. So if you're below belly button, you need two letters. And most people answer correctly that you want two letters of mental health support. 
But if you think surgery is simple versus complex, if it's a simple surgery, you do not need 12 months of living full time in the desired role. So for an orchiectomy, if the patient comes to you with two letters and they've been on hormones for 12 months, you can offer them an orchiectomy. Uh, the basic criteria, things like cardiovascular health and just basic stuff that you would do for a chirp, for example. So that's the important distinction between the complex genital surgery and the orchiectomy. You don't need 12 months of full living for an orchiectomy. Um, and we know that, uh, so another part I didn't say in the beginning, I'm gonna uh, only focus today on feminizing surgery. Joe Paris did both last week and I always do a talk on both and I always feel being out of time and kind of really not going over each part in detail. So I figured I'll focus on complications of vaginoplasty today. And if there's a lot of interest in specific detailed phalloplasty, we can always do that. And there are also a lot of physicians uh, and experts out there that we can recruit for that. Uh, so let's talk specifically uh, bottom um, gender affirming surgery, which essentially can be orchiectomy alone, uh, or vaginoplasty, labiaplasty, which uh, has two options with that, uh, within, right? Full depth and uh, shallow depth. So let's do orchiectomy first, because again, that does not require a fellowship or any kind of extensive training. Once you see a patient, important part, and it can, be, uh, it can vary state by state, but definitely in California, unlike a vasectomy or tubal ligation, the orchiect bilateral orchiectomy for gender affirming purposes or for gender dysphoria does not require sterilization consent, does not require a 30-day or 72-hour uh, waiting period. Especially in young patients, it's important to discuss fertility preservation. Yes, we know the quality of sperm really declines after being on estrogen on hormones for 12 months, but there is viable sperm there. There is an option of going off hormones and evaluating that. If you're in California, there is a state law that many insurances have to cover fertility preservation as it's considered iatrogenic infertility. And uh, many states are looking at that law as well uh, right now. Well, right now, nobody's looking at it, but that's going to be post-COVID post issues. Uh, you can definitely make it through a small incision. There used to be a myth that as you take the testicles out, you use scrotal skin and unable to do vaginoplasty later. And that's what it is. It's a myth. You're absolutely free to do the orchiectomy regardless of patient's further plans. And as Joe mentioned in his talk, we take the cord really, really high. Essentially, I take it at the level of the ring and then I plug that a little nubbin of the cord in, internally inside the ring because you don't want any uh, bumping or bulging or anything left in the groin as it will start to spray it uh, uh, further down. Um, uh, once the testicles are out, patients can uh, stop their spironolactone. And if you survey your patients for reasons why they want the orchiectomy, even if the vaginoplasty is somewhere down the line in their plans, is mostly because patients really hate uh, the side effects of spironolactone uh, and potential renal insufficiency with that. So they can stop spironolactone that day, and usually they can reduce their estrogen uh, dose by half, but they do need to see their endocrine or their primary care physician uh, for more uh, sort of more detailed dosing, but in general, 50% drop in estrogen need post, uh, post orchiectomy. So let's go on the bottom uh, complex feminizing surgery. As we know, there is a zero depth and full depth vaginoplasty. We know there is a variety of approaches. One comment about zero depth when we started, we call it zero depth because that's what it is. It's essentially vulvoplasty. And it seemed like calling it shallow depth was really in vogue, both on the physician side and the patient side, because it just seems less, I guess, definitive or less zero. Uh, what we've learned that when we say shallow depth, a lot of patients perceive it as that you are giving them some vaginal vault or some, something in there that potentially can lead to ability to have penetrative intercourse. So we've learned our lesson that if we are doing a shallow or zero depth, we kind of went back to calling it zero depth and uh, very, very carefully explaining to the patient that what you result with other than external appearance of female genitalia is really a dimple. There is no, uh, no depth in there to maintain any kind of meaningful intercourse, whether it's uh, with a penis or any kind of toy or dilator. So we've, we've learned that uh, while shallow sounds a little bit better, we should call things what they are. Uh, we 
talk about approaches of penile inversion and peritoneal and a colon vagina, but we're going to focus here on the uh, penile inversion vaginoplasty. So uh, what I what we do for patients as we go through the class getting ready for this, we show them very similar slides mainly. I feel like if you understand the steps of surgery and the pitfalls, you understand where the complications come from. Uh, starting with electrolysis, uh, it's very important uh, hair removal before the vaginoplasty. And people vary in their beliefs on the electrolysis versus, um, versus laser. And I'm in an electrolysis camp. You don't have to be in my camp. I feel this is more permanent. Uh, and I will show you a picture later of what happens when the hair removal was not done uh, adequately or properly before, uh, before the surgery. And then sometimes patients are in a hurry. They really want to get into that sort of slot that was open last minute. And I would really strongly encourage to not uh, succumb to the, to the pressure in making sure that the hair has been removed properly. So this is uh, our marking. While I'm on this, uh, I'll also mention uh, there are various uh, practices out there on uh, how we uh, manage hormones. We personally stop hormones two weeks prior and everybody gets heparin at the time of surgery, but this is very variable. Um, we do do a free uh, graft and uh, my plastic surgeon on the back table prepares the uh, apex uh, of the vagina while I'm doing the dissection. I'm gonna spend a minute here on this neovaginal canal because I think it's probably the hardest thing to learn in this surgery and that's where most of the complications arise that lead to uh, serious problems. Um, initially when I learned, I kind of went on a, almost like on a whim with someone uh, that I trained with, but it never seemed an, uh, kind of made anatomical sense to me until I went back to sort of blends and surgical atlases and back to the idea of how they did an open perineal prostatectomy because that's essentially what we're doing here. And uh, as you all know, we go essentially in a space where the non vas fascia is between the prostate and the rectum. So if you go into a uh, Glenn's atlas and you look for that uh, diagram of starting with your uh, perineal prostatectomy, this is a Lowe's retractor, this is a prostate, and that's your entry posterior leaves of the non vas the first thing you do is kind of on our uh, picture here, sorry I went too far, you want to take your central tendon down as far as uh, you're able until you're completely free between the uh, rectum and the apex of the prostate. And then you want to take down retroureteralis, which gives you a mobility at the level of the apex of the prostate right here. Uh, this is a picture from Hugh Hampton Young's uh, original drawing on them do on him doing a perineal prostatectomy. So there also another approach was called belt approach, and I can't tell you that I know what uh, exactly Dr. Belt did, but Hampton Hugh Young did what we're doing now for vaginoplasty: is taking down retroureteralis and getting exact, dropping that sort of attachment of the rectum down and getting into the non VAs. The difference is that he was operating on patients with 100 gram prostates and we're operating on patients who've been on estrogen for a number of years. So our landmarks for the apex of the prostate are really different. Uh, so this is back to this diagram of getting into the space and the, the old surgeon that helped me learn uh, getting into the place kept saying this thing pearly gates and I thought he kind of made it up and then I found this also in the glands, in the, in the, uh, in the glands atlas of that the space between anterior and posterior layers of the non VAs actually exists and it's been called the pearly gates. So this, I tried to take a picture of it, never it looks as good as sort of a, it is in my mind, but if you look at it, this is the anterior layer and my alices are on the posterior layer of the non VAs and there is this white glistening space and if you find the space or when you find the space, you know you're safe, you know you're not near uh, the rectum and you know you're kind of at the base of the prostate because you're right here. And if you're at the base of the prostate, it's very hard to injure uh, urethra or the bladder. So kind of going back to the anatomy, it helps you to keep your landmarks. Um, I'm gonna see if this works and I apologize for the sound, but what I'm trying to show here, my alices are on the posterior uh, denon VAs and my left hand is in the rectum to show you that there is no injury and was dissected into that area of the pearly gate. I'm gonna uh, move that. Uh, 
So bladder or urethral injury can happen, and it happened to me a few times early on, and it's easily recognizable, obviously. You either see your lows there, there is urine. You, you repair it, uh, and you cover it with a bulbocarinosis muscle that you hopefully have uh, preserved uh, in your prior dissection. Rectal injury, obviously, a much more devastating uh, situation. You, you want to repair it. Again, cover it with the muscle, so I don't get rid of the muscle until the very end. We know if unrecognized will lead to the fistula, and even if recognized and repaired, still 20% of those repaired can lead to the fistula formation. And I'll show you uh, a couple of those images. This is a quick video that once we get into the space, we can get your hernia retractor into the neovaginal space and really di uh, bluntly spread all the way to the perineal reflection. Another part that's important to do after that, that I don't have it on the video, is to take down the levators on uh, lateral sides of the incision. If we fail to do that, uh, this is a male pelvic floor. It's much narrower than a female uh, pelvic floor, and these muscles have, tend to have a higher tone. So failure to take down the levators during this dissection can lead to pelvic floor issues as well as a difficulty with passive dilator. So we've, uh, over time really extended that lateral elevator dissection. So let's uh, get, this is a neurovascular bundle. I'm gonna speed this up a little bit so we can actually get to, uh, to complications because we're about halfway through. So your neuro, uh, neurovascular bundle, though this is an important point that there are two also techniques here. You can keep your tunica and not touch the bundle and there's a group of surgeons who would actually dissect the neurovascular bundle the way we would do for Peronis. Um, and uh, get rid of the entire tunica albuginia. I tend to believe that the less you mess with the bundle, the, uh, the less insult you, uh, you cause to, the, uh, to this nerve. And we leave the urethra down. Uh, here down on the bottom, these are the bases of the corpora. I tend to take the corpora essentially all the way down, and if there's a little bit left, I would destroy the content uh, of the corpora to avoid any bulging uh, down, uh, down the line. Also, before we're done with this dissection, on the ventral aspect of the urethra, we would taper the bulb because bulb also will cause the bulging if left uh, in, in its intact full size. Then we we'll proceed with a, a clitoris and clitoral hood formation and attachment of the apex of vagina to the uh, actual penile skin. So you get your uh, vaginal wall. And this is where we invert hands of penile and virgin vaginoplasty. We do not put sacrocolpopexy uh, type uh, sutures. Uh, we do put some fibrin glue into the space and pack this very tight and leave uh, everything sort of sewn in uh, for five days postoperatively. So now the, uh, the vaginal canal is uh, lined with the skin, uh, packed. And then what we do over here, is we make a vertical incision on this uh, inverted penile skin and we bring the clitoris and the urethra through and mature the urethra and uh, create a continuity of the labia minora with the uh, labia majora here. Uh, uh, I know there's a number of practices where the dorsal strip of the urethra uh, stays intact as a sort of a backbone and this is sort of to prove that there are multiple ways of doing the surgery. I personally dislike the appearance and the look of it, and I'll show you one of the slides, but people probably have good outcomes with that as well, and we all sort of stick with seems to work for us and uh, works for patients. So we've matured our technique over years. We uh, improved sort of the appearance of the labia minora, as well as a clitoral hood, and that's kind of our progression through the cases uh, through a number of years. Uh, stay, it would keep folks in the hospital for six days because a lot of our patients come from far, but we uh, get them ambulating post-op day one. Uh, dilation starts on day five, uh, starts with a four times a day and slowly tapers uh, down. We make sure no one goes home unless they are really comfortable dilating. Uh, most people go home with, uh, without their catheter, but uh, sometimes if retention occurs, you can't go with like so this is somebody three, uh, three months post-op, and uh, this is a speculum exam at about three months. Uh, a little bit on functional outcomes. This is our personal data. I know the functional outcomes, the, there's not really good validated 
uh, means of evaluating how well the surgeries work, especially from a patient perspective. Uh, on our review of sort of just general uh, satisfaction survey, most patients were very satisfied or satisfied with functional and cosmetic outcomes. But as you see, there's always somebody who was very dissatisfied or very dissatisfied. We also looked at their uh, sexual function, asking for presence of clitoral sensation or orgasm, as well as a decision regret. And uh, this was overall satisfaction and uh, numbers on the clitoral sensation and orgasm you can see on the right of your screen. And a decisional regret scale is a standard validated questionnaire and we're happy to see that on a scale from one to four, one uh, was the predominant answer in our cohort of patients. While we personally did not have a patient yet to ask for a reversal, we definitely know that regret does exist and uh, definitely uh, presents a, a challenging situation. So let's go uh, through complications. Uh, bleeding post-op, that's something you would encounter if you, if you practice and perform the surgeries primarily. Uh, this is our very, very early case and we take the person back and bleeding was from the urethral bed. What we've learned over time that uh, this is definitely where the most bleeding occurs as a urethral bed and we've adjusted our technique of how we mature uh, the urethral stump. Important to evacuate the hematoma because as it progresses, it in your drain, especially if your drains are not putting out enough, uh, it can progress into the vaginal canal, which will separate the, uh, the penile skin from the vaginal vault, and that ultimately will lead to a necrosis and a death of that vaginal lining, which might heal by secondary intent, and in most cases it will, but it can lead to loss of the vaginal canal. So let's go over uh, sort of a common things that you can see in clinics. So if somebody comes to your clinic, you don't have to say, I don't know what I'm looking at, because that was my situation about five years ago. Uh, just vaginal bleeding on dilation or patients saying, I have a blood in the dilator. Most commonly, it's a granulation tissue. And all you need to do is put a speculum in there if they're at about six weeks out. Uh, or um, after a month, I, oh, you can put a speculum, you find that spot and you use a silver nitrate. Silver nitrate really becomes your friend. If there's extensive granulation tissue, you can take them to the operating room and gently either do a lot of silver nitrating or gentle cautery in the OR. Uh, just be very aware of where the other structures are. Uh, hydrocortisone and medihoney I put in parentheses because they're commonly used in practice. I personally don't use them, but I know they're uh, widely used. Uh, by other practitioners. This is a case that I've, uh, actually my first uh, transgender post-vaginoplasty patient I've ever seen was done elsewhere and I had no idea what I was looking at other than being a little bit scared. Um, but now I know it's just an extremely severe wound breakdown and in this particular case it sort of speaks to the importance of the patient selection of support uh, both uh, network and just being stable in your life having proper nutrition and a place to sleep and a place to eat and shower, which none of these things um, were the, uh, the case with this patient. But amazing that even with this extreme wound breakdown, this everything heals. So as in this patient, her wound uh, breakdown actually improved and she did heal. Uh, what I didn't realize then, and I wasn't aware of that, that if you stop dilating that vaginal canal, however awful that wound is, this vaginal canal will close. And that's what happened to her, her vaginal canal completely obliterated. Um, also, she had an issue, which I will talk a little bit more on the next slide, is a deviated urinary stream. So this is her lost vaginal canal. That's essentially, she turned into a zero depth vaginoplasty. That's what it looks like, like a dimple. And if you look at it, urethra is pointing up. And if you think where a female urethra points, if you do a pelvic exam on a female, it kind of looks at you, it doesn't look up. So that leads to urinary stream being deviated up, kind of this particular patient needed a paper plate to, to get her uh, stream into the toilet. Um, so it is an easy fix. You probably don't need to be an extremely sort of expert in, um, in vaginoplasty surgery to uh, just outline the urethra and uh, free this up here and bring the urethra a little bit lower down and remature the space. So if the patient, if you're in the area where there's no uh, expert gender surgeons, 
and uh, it's really hard to get their other insurance change. I think after talking to someone who's done this before, this is something that most of us can do. Um, and I encourage you to, try, uh, to be at least open to it. Uh, if somebody comes to your clinic saying, I had a surgery three, four uh, months ago and this white stuff is there, don't be afraid. There's just granulation tissue. It will pass. You can uh, use some silver nitrate on it. Uh, you can see the old vicryls are still uh, here and dissolving. And this is usually the area where things break down because it's kind of your uh, watershed area. And again, no matter how sort of scary and weird it looks, uh, you got to keep dilating. And that's kind of my overall message from this talk. And that's the same patient from here, but a number of weeks later. Uh, this just looks bad, but there's nothing really off about it. Just a lot of swelling and it will come down. Uh, again, this is clitoris, this is urethra, and this is a vaginal wall. So in terms of if you look at it and kind of, again, wonder where stuff is, that's where things are uh, located. And continue dilating. If their prior dilator doesn't fit, uh, because of a lot of swelling, it's okay to go back to the maybe a smaller dilator, but definitely do not stop dilating. Uh, another more sort of very common look uh, after surgery and all the scabs and the scars will soften up with time. Uh, this is somebody three, four months after surgery, probably actually more than that. And the usual complaint here is difficulty with dilating. And this particular patient had difficulty with intercourse because there was essentially a bridge or a gate over the vaginal canal. And Vaginal canal is right here. And that's also not uncommon when that sort of a W type area skin heals, it causes a very high posterior for shed in a way, a posterior web. And with a small uh, Z plasty, uh, YV plasty, it, it's essentially you take it down and uh, there's no risk to injuring anything here. Just take this down. Obviously, continue dilating. So let's talk fistula because that's something we are, are all. Um, aware of and really want to avoid. So this is somebody who developed a fistula probably from an unrecognized injury, uh, again, done uh, out of state. So historically, before these surgeries were done in large uh, academic institutions and done in small practices, the normal pathway for this fistula were to stop dilating. Because if you stop dilating, you lose the vaginal canal. And if you lose the vaginal canal, you essentially treat your fistula that way. Think about it. Um, so that was this person was told to do is to just stop dilating. We really approached it in a more formal fistula repair like you would approach any fistula uh, that you would see in a cis uh, patient post other surgical intervention. So she got a colostomy and we've treated it the way you would again approach a perineal repair of the fistula. We separated the layers, identified the fistula extract, closed it in multiple layers, and use the gracilis um, muscle uh, as an extra layer. Uh, there was a little bit paucity of the skin here when we were trying to close, so we used a small uh, skin graft there as well for extra coverage. That allowed patient not to lose her vaginal canal and continue dilating, uh, which was very obviously an, uh, a good uh, outcome given her fistula. Uh, sometimes people are cautious of putting a gracilis flap in there because it can bulge in the canal and while it's not obliterated, it definitely can narrow the canal. Uh, this is somebody with a urethra neovaginal fistula. So this is the Foley. It's not a Foley, it's a sound, but this is the urethra and that's the fistula. So again, we approached it the way you would treat a urethra vaginal fistula. We repaired it in layers. Uh, there was enough layers of the tissue there to close primarily. Uh, my colleague Mitri Nikolowski in Syracuse is uh, in the process of publishing a video where he had the patient who had four or five fistulas sort of along the entire urethra and the, and the prostate. And he approached it, and you can also use a buccal uh, strip here. Putting a gracilis here presents an, an issue mostly of the bulk of the gracilis and the way you have to rotate it here. So he did a very creative approach of uh, putting his buccal dorsally and closing the urethra uh, in the ventral aspect. So that's another approach for this. So you can uh, get very creative here with understanding like with any fistula, uh, things do fail. And because your vaginal canal is not really a vascularized vaginal mucosa, as you see in cis female, you always need to think of extra layers and extra sources of uh, blood supply.
So this is what we did for uh, for this patient. We closed it in layers, closed vaginal canal, and uh, she did well. And again, she did not need to stop dilating, which is very important. This is more of a superficial wound dehiscence and granulation tissue. When it's this sort of uh, exit fitting, we, we cut it off, use some silver nitrine, and that goes away with time. Uh, this is uh, something that's also very easy to diagnose and relatively easy to fix, especially in the probably first couple of attempts, is uh, the medial stenosis. Uh, Diagnosis-wise, uh, like anybody with a urethral stricture, they had the normal flow and then they come to you with a weak flow on the exam. It's very obvious. I know Joe used this picture uh, from our chapter the other day. And... Uh, some people would say that probably the fact that we use the technique where we uh, primarily anastomose the urethra to the vaginal canal, the numbers seem still uh, low enough for us to uh, maintain this technique. As I will show you, uh, I'll, I'll show you why uh, is our personal preference. It's very easy to identify it. You take out this strictured uh, fragment and then you remature your urethral meatus after you spatulate it. And essentially think of it as a perineal urethrostomy. And I know everyone of you know how to do that. Uh, this is my reason, and ignore this, that's probably not particularly aesthetically pleasing, but that's my reason for why I dislike uh, leaving the posterior or uh, dorsal urethra as a plate for the clitoris. After a number of years, it tends to have that kind of like a dry pink appearance because there is no um, there's no lubrication or urine coming through that area and it starts looking kind of an old pink crinkly paper. But that's, uh, that's again, uh, personal preference or unpreference of mine. Uh, this is another interesting uh, case. If we were in the more kind of like, was able to talk to you back and forth, I would sort of ask you what do you think it is, but I can tell you that uh, this is somebody who had a surgery about a year ago uh, did well, very sexually active, and uh, started to have bleeding uh, on the exam. Her entire vaginal vault was covered with, uh, with warts. So uh, vaginal warts, whether she uh, was positive before uh, or these are new, uh, hard to tell, but uh, that's, you treat them like you would treat a vaginal warts or penile warts and anyone else. We've uh, done all the proper, you know, that was before COVID time, so we had easy access to all the proper uh, equipment uh, to resect those and uh, have this patient on close surveillance. Uh, this is one of the cases, um, of course it's not mine, right? You always show somebody else's complications. This is one of the cases where you look externally and you say, okay, that looks pretty much okay. And then you open up and you kind of go, I don't even know what I'm looking at. Um, Neither did I. Uh, we kind of identified that there is a clitoris here and then there is a urethra right here and a vaginal vulvus here, but there was not a very um, sort of easy thing to sort out and uh, underwent a revision later on. Uh, this is probably something I wouldn't do if I haven't done this for, for a period of time or someone who's, who's seen this before. Uh, this is a very common uh, presentation where patients complain of bulging with arousal, and that means that either their urethral bulb or bases of the corpora have been left over and uh, are remnants in there uh, during their vaginoplasty. It is a relatively easy uh, solution to that, where you sort of uh, make uh, an incision here, taper the bulb. If you find the corporal bodies, you get rid of them, and then uh, we also kind of of restored a little bit of anatomy of the labia for her and repositioned the urethra. If you look here, the urethra is also pointing up. So if you uh, kind of bring the urethra in this position so she can uh, urinate uh, pointing down. This is a result of uh, what happens if you don't do proper electrolysis or laser uh, hair removal before surgery. You start getting these concretions and pretty ugly hair balls, which you, there's not much other to do than just uh, intermittently get those things removed. Uh, hair removal creams don't quite work and every electrologist or person who does hair uh, laser I've asked to try to do something intravaginal, we're not particularly excited to try. Uh, this is slides the courtesy of one of my colleagues from New York. This is someone with stenosis. The vaginal canal was intact, but there was an ex uh, more of a distal stenosis that was uh, repaired with lateral incisions and there are two buccal uh, grafts here on the sides. 
And this is where uh, we are sort of three months post-surgery, older patients with a lot of saggy skin and somewhat lower expectations are definitely uh, easier to get the results that uh, patients desire. As we're seeing more and more younger folks, patients who've been on hormones early on and expectations of the cosmetic outcome that really matches the cis appearance um, is here, the, the, cos the cosmesis uh, is becoming uh, sort of difficult to find a consensus between what's realistic and uh, what's desired. But I think also as our techniques evolve, we're getting uh, better and better cosmetic outcomes that are matching the, the cis equivalents. But as we all know, no vagina is the same. They all look uh, different and so, so do ours. And uh, this is my phenomenal team of social worker, physicians, assistant, administrator, case manager, and uh, our, our surgeon. So I, uh, with that, I wanna tell you that you know more than you think. Um, and I hope uh, this helps you take care of the transgender patients that you encounter in your practice. And this is it. Thank you. I Dr. hope Reba. I this time. Oh, Dr. Reba, thank you. That was a really great talk. Um, really, a lot of really good information in there. We have um, some good questions that have come in. Uh, so hopefully we can just kind of dive in uh, with some of the questions that have come in. Um, one of the first questions was, how long do you wait typically to kind of ensure hair removal? And if there is hair present at the time of surgery, uh, do you hold off or do you do hair removal on the back table once you remove uh, the um, graft? It's a very good question. So we, uh, once we see patients in consultation, we evaluate their skin presence or, uh, or hair presence. Everyone is a little bit different. In our experience, depending on the amount of hair one has, it takes about from, I would say, six to nine months of electrolysis sessions to get adequate hair removal. It also depends if patient can go every week versus once a month, if they can do half an hour session versus we have some people who can tolerate three hour session. So that's all uh, variable. What we usually do is, and most electrologists will work with, they're experienced electrologists for this particular uh, situation. When patient gets, uh, in their view, ready for that, they contact us and we will see patients for hair check. We've had to cancel a number of surgeries where hair removal wasn't adequately done, so we've learned our lesson. And about three to four weeks to their scheduled date, we will come for a hair check. Now we do a lot of televisits, makes a little, it's a little weird, but we still do a hair check, uh, sometimes over a video visit. And if the hair removal is not adequate, that gives us a month to actually find somebody for that surgery spot and allow the patient to go back for a couple sessions. As you know, the hair cycle is about six weeks. So our hair check has to be about six weeks or four weeks after the last electrolysis, electrolysis session. Otherwise, you're getting a little bit of a false uh, hairless exam. Great. Um, and uh, obviously, we, we know that there, um, there are a lot of factors that come into play as far as, as you mentioned, as far as nutrition, um, potentially uh, self-care. What is your counseling process as far as patients who come in, maybe like who are smokers, be it on the heavier side with a higher BMI, um, or you know, patients who may not have a great social support, do you have a specific counseling spiel that you give these patients? To? We, we do. So our, every our patient sees a case manager and a social worker. That's on top of their mental health professional who uh, gives them their letters of support. I'll go sort of over uh, specific things that you've mentioned. So for smoking, it's an absolute contraindication. We will not uh, do the surgery on anyone who, be, uh, unless they quit smoking for three months before surgery. So that's, uh, that's kind of like a, where we draw the line. Uh, BMI, we have a cutoff of 35, although we've done two patients uh, with a higher BMI, and I can tell you it's a very, very difficult undertaking. And also, besides that it's difficult on the surgeon, maybe it's not as important, but it's very difficult recovery, definitely higher uh, risk of uh, graft death and uh, graft necrosis. So we've learned from two of patients over BMI of 40 that we did operate on that is um, that it's, it's just not an optimal situation. So we definitely make an agreement with the patient in terms of where 
would be, and as you know, somebody with BMI of 45 is not going to go to BMI of 35 in, in two months, but we, we make agreements with the patient together with social worker of where we would take that. Uh, in terms of social support, we uh, do require that patients have somebody uh, to help them and take care of them. Uh, we, for the most part, ask that caregiver to come to them to several consultations, although between consultation and time of surgery, it can be six to nine months. So things are fluid, but if the patient loses their uh, either support or job or place to live, we would postpone the surgery. This is not a surgery to do when you're in a bad place socially or mentally. It just makes it for very, very difficult recovery and high complication. Great. Um, and then getting into a little bit of the intraoperative uh, questions. Um, so you mentioned, um, you know, sparing bubble, the bubble cavernosis muscle. So how do you go about doing that if that's required for a flap? Just if you can comment so, a little bit on it. Very good question. So what I do when I dissect through the uh, central tendon, your muscle is still there. So I don't touch it until I get into the canal. Let's say I did get an injury on the, like a, on the urethral side. I will mobilize that bulbar cavernosis on one side. So now you have a good meaty sort of piece of muscle that you can cover your uh, repair before you invert uh, your penile skin. And same for the posterior. If uh, I were to injure the rectum, I would mobilize the muscle. I would free it up off the corpora on one side, depending where the injury is, and kind of uh, use it as a coverage after I've done the primary repair. Okay. And this kind of gets into our next question. So um, one commenter asked if uh, with a 20% fistula rate, uh, when you recognize a rectal injury, uh, do you just repair and continue or do you abort and come back another day? So we continue. I have to say we've, uh, in our three years, we've been very fortunate and we've got into a rectum once. Uh, we repaired primarily covered and did not get a fistula. That being said, we've repaired other people's fistula. So they definitely happen and you see this report. But uh, what we did though for that specific patient, uh, after we've uh, covered it with muscle and continued with the case, we did not start dilation at day six like we do otherwise. We brought her back, took out the packing, repacked her with a fresh packing for another week. So we postponed the dilation uh, by a week. Whether it's the right thing to do or not, there was a little bit of a learning on the spot. And either it's a, it's a good protocol or we got lucky, but we did not get a fistula in that specific case. And um, can you comment a little bit on the necessity to repair urethroneovaginal fistulas if they're distal to the sphincter? Are you repairing all fistulas or just those with incontinence? That's a very good question. So I've, uh, I've caused two fistula in my three years and one of them I didn't repair because she is not symptomatic. You're absolutely right who, who asked the question. If it's very distal, you will not have symptoms and she never noticed split stream because I think she, predominantly voids through the fistula. Although that specific patient also has recurrent UTIs, which hard to explain by the fistula itself, but that's sort of the reality of that patient. And she herself declined the repair. The other fistula uh, had a very symptomatic split stream and she kind of felt like urinating through the meatus and also intravaginal. And we repaired it because, because it was symptomatic. Okay, great. And how would you recommend going about managing strictures or medial stenosis in the emergent setting? Let's say they're going to a center um, that may not have a transgender reconstructionist. Do you recommend, is it okay to dilate and place a catheter? Is it better just to place a suprapubic tube? That's a very good question. I think if it's a first uh, presentation, like I showed you, somebody with a narrow uh, opening and like any medial stenosis, I think you can dilate and put a catheter in, and uh, we have dilated. The only part I'm almost certain that they will all recur. It's not like your regular stricture when you dilate and have some percentage of people who will maintain the patency, but it definitely buys you time. I don't think you uh, burn your bridges by dilating and putting a catheter in, especially if it's their, let's say, first presentation, and then uh, figuring out a place for them to go or consulting with someone how to repair it. But in an emerging setting, uh, I think it's safe, unlike in a trans masculine patients, right? Patients who have this reconstructive urethra with sparse fixa and sparse pendularis where 
you can definitely cause some issues. Think about these folks, it's a short male urethra. If you get uh, your uh, wire and dilators in, you're safe to dilate. Perfect. And um, can you comment a little bit more specifically on where you place the fibrin glue during your penile inversion and have you had any experience at all with say the graft falling out um, and then what do you do? So right before uh, inverting that penile skin when we put a diver in there we literally put it on um, on the diver so if if this is our diver with a penile skin on it we put it in and as we uh, invert it into the place, that's where we place it. Uh, we have not had experience with stuff falling out, although we definitely heard from our colleagues and seen reports. One of the things that it, when it does happen is when you take out your packing, if the packing is really dry and stuck in there, and potentially if you've had uh, a hematoma or something that prevented your skin graft uh, from sticking to the vaginal canal, uh, that's probably where you get uh, that sort of essentially prolapse. What we've started doing, because early on it felt like as we we're pulling the packing, it was a little bit sort of hairy. We uh, obviously packing is very much saturated in, uh, uh, in neosporin or any kind of like Vaseline grease. We also put a small red Robinson alongside the packing right before we take it out and uh, put some saline with a catheter tip syringe to sort of really re-moisturize that packing so it's easier to take out. The first, if, if you do have vagina fall out, you want to repack it back and pray essentially, but these cases from uh, our communication have a really high chance of loss of that, uh, of that vaginal canal and probably will need a revision later on. Yeah. Um, and uh, someone's asking, are you able to reach the peritoneal reflection on every case? And what's your average depth that you get on your neovagina that you achieve? So the first uh, question is yes. Uh, and the second question is sort of like what I tell my patients is everybody is different. And the space, the length of the neovagina really depends on the space that you have from the perineum to your seminal vesicles or your uh, personal peritoneal reflection. It's definitely, I think, somewhat height dependent, but also anatomy dependent. Uh, you saw the two Haney retractors. Uh, I've so far been able always to get the Haney, both Haney's into the, to that right angle deflection and pass that. Um, I will never stick to a number because that's something that I think in, uh, in the gender affirmation surgery field you can get in trouble as people really come saying I want a nine inch vagina or I want seven inch and that number is also do you measure it to the labia do you measure it to the introitus. Um, but uh, everybody that I've operated on we were able to get to the peritoneal reflection. Uh, and just to get in a little bit into postoperatively, so you mentioned that you give patients sub-Q heparin at the time of surgery. Um, do you continue the sub-Q heparin postoperatively, or is there a concern for increased risk for hematoma? We continue postoperatively in leg squeezers, yeah, and then we stop before they go home. Okay. And similarly, um, what is your uh, role, what, what is your plan for use of estrogen or resuming estrogen postoperatively? They uh, go home on half the dose of estrogen they came with, and then they have an appointment with their endocrinologist within a week of discharge. And sometimes on the telephone, so they can redraw the levels and see uh, where their new dosage, dosage is. Great. Um, and then just going back uh, to preoperative management, do you ever suggest or offer to any of your patients with, say, BMIs over 40, um, bariatric surgery? Is that useful or helpful at all? Uh, we definitely, what we do is we send them to a program uh, because we're an integrated system. So we send them to our uh, colleagues in the bariatric program to work through what options can be done for these patients. We've had somebody to undergo bariatric surgery, but we haven't sort of gone to operating on the patient. We've, it's, it's a challenging issue like for anybody who is in this category, uh, but it can be offered. A lot of it is as you all know, weight loss is a long-term commitment and it's not an easy journey. Definitely. Um, and can you comment a little bit on your experience with intestinal or colovaginal plasties and complications from them? 
So uh, my personal experience is the complications of the surgery. Someone that we've seen in clinic coming from elsewhere. Uh, currently, uh, I, I don't perform them personally. Um, I can tell you from the cosmetic appearance and the functional appearance, it's something that I would try to avoid in patients, especially now considering that we're widely adopting the peritoneal reflection uh, approaches that I think in the long term, if we can avoid intestinal vaginoplasty, that would be ideal. Okay. And um, someone is asking about um, performing prostate exams post vaginoplasty. Um, is this more challenging? Is this more difficult? Um, and what has been your experience, say, with monitoring patients for prostate cancer um, who've had vaginoplasty? That's a very good question. And let me take it sort of one step back is monitoring transgender patients who are not, who have not had vaginoplasty. And the sort of the teaching or the thought out there was that people on estrogen cannot develop prostate cancer. We know that's not the fact. We know that there are a couple of papers, just case reports outlining that there are isolated cases of prostate cancer on patients being on estrogen. So in our practice, everybody over 40 does get a PSA and a rectal exam before vaginoplasty. We have found in our practice one patient who ended up with a uh, being diagnosed with prostate cancer as she was evaluated for vaginoplasty. Uh, Postoperatively, you stay with the guidelines for screening and your exam is actually easier, but it becomes a vaginal exam. So think of where your neovaginal canal is now. It's sitting right on the prostate. Um, I do have a conversation with all my patients, especially the young ones, saying that if you're 20 now, by the time you're 45 or 50, I'll be long gone. You will forget that you've ever had male parts and on all your charts and documents, you will be a female. So you are the only one who will remember and need to be responsible for knowing that you need a PSA and you need a, a prostate exam. But exam itself physically is easy. Okay. And um, just a few more. So uh, you use the penile inversion technique as far as deciding, you know, if you need additional skin for, um, for your vagina, do you have a preference on where you get the term scrotal, abdominal? Can you talk a little bit more about that? Right. That's, that's a very good question. We definitely talk to every patient and, and consent also says that skin graft from elsewhere. So there's always a potential that you won't have enough skin and then the groin crease uh, would be the next area and uh, probably the buttock uh, under buttocks would be another area. I'm very fortunate to work with a phenomenal plastic surgeon that I trust uh, completely to find the best source of skin. Um, so I'll be honest, I would defer to her had it needs to happen, but we've been very fortunate even if people was very uh, sort of with paucity of scrotal and penile skin, we've been able to create enough skin coverage. But as we're progressing and in, in developing further into gender affirmation surgery, and we have patients who go not even on the hormone, uh, but on the, um, on the puberty blockers, right? When we have teenagers going on puberty blockers so early that they will not have an opportunity to develop any uh, genital skin, I think the peritoneal uh, uh, neovaginas will become a primary, uh, primary surgery in this setting. As many of you probably know, Li Zhao and NYU is pioneering it as a revision, but also we have enough data, I think, to slowly uh, consider this as uh, one of the options for primary surgery in the very near future. Great, and I think we probably have time for one more um, as we're almost out of time. Um, can you comment or give some any advice uh, potentially from your experience on how to maybe better educate some of our colleagues that say in the emergency room or um, in other services that may, you know, not have as much experience dealing with transgender patients and how we might better incorporate or educate these patients so that we're not exploiting them when they come to, to right. see them. That's a very good question. And I spent a uh, probably a good part of last 18 months doing this in Southern California. And I'm in a fortunate setting where our emergency rooms are also integrated as well as all our hospitals in Southern California. We went to uh, essentially every urology department, OBGYN department, and uh, many of the emergency rooms with a talk similar to this, but a lot less technical in terms of details of surgery, but going over uh, what to do if the patient comes to, you, uh, to your emergency room. We also have agreements specifically for trans, uh, 
transmasculine patients that uh, leave our hospital with suprapubic tubes. Uh, and every, uh, for contact us directly, or our patients also have a way to contact us or our case manager, if they show up in the emergency room that these catheters or these reconstructions don't get disturbed or moved or sort of uh, adversely affected. But it's a lot of work. It's something that you have to really commit some time, effort, and education materials to and get uh, a buy-in from their emergency room areas, emergency rooms in the hospitals in your area. You kind of have to go and meet and um, appeal to the humanistic part of our colleagues to understand that these folks don't go to the emergency room for fun. They hate going to their emergency room just as much as the emergency room dislikes seeing them because they don't know what to do. So uh, any just kind word and contact with a primary surgeon probably is, um, sort of step one, and a lot of things can be dealt with uh, with very minor intervention on the emergency room part. Definitely. Well, Dr. Reba, thank you. We are at 11.10, so I wanna be uh, mindful and respectful of everyone's time, but thank you so much for a great time. Thank you for, for a great talk, and thank you for your time. Um, we will yeah. be sure to, any questions that we didn't get to, we will uh, send to you and then post later, um, and please make sure that you fill out your surveys um, everyone, thank you for joining us and thanks again. Great, thank you.